So I know we said we weren't going to hit the road this week, but when we got a call from PJ and said he wanted to meet us at what I think is one of the best kept secrets in the Midwest, Bruce Mound, well, I couldn't resist. So let's head on over to the desk so we can talk all things skiing and riding around the Midwest. Well, welcome to another episode of the Rope Tour Report Live. We made an audible. We got a call from PJ here. He said he was going to be at Bruce Mound, and we decided rather than doing it studio, we were going to come out here, and what better day to do an outside showing. Thanks thanks for everybody wearing the sunglasses today. We appreciate that. So A bit warm today. Uh, for, yeah, to talk snowmaking, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. <laughs> but to introduce my guest for today, uh, PJ Britz, who is the, uh, what is your title? Midwest? Uh, yeah, Midwest uh, Sales Manager for Techno Alpin. And I do have to wish PJ a happy birthday. Today is his birthday, oddly enough. Uh, a surprising, another October birthday. And PJ, actually, we're going to get things started here. I did, I grabbed, because I know you share ber October birthdays with a lot of ski industry members. So I'm going to go through these and see if you can guess them. So we'll start with the first one. Uh, this individual grew up skiing at Buck Hill, is a four-time Olympic medalist, and she has a rope toe named after her. Lin it's Lindsay Lindsay's birthday today? Well, in October. Oh, Lindsay Vaughn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. Okay. Very good. I didn't know she was an October birthday. She out. is. So we'll go to another <laughs> October. I'm so honored to share <laughs> birthday month with her. <laughs> we'll go to another October birthday here. Um, this one, he was born in Hollywood, of all places, lived in a teardrop trailer to start his career, and has produced over 50 feature ski films. Well, Stretching so, all I mean, the way. It's not Warren Miller, is it? Yeah, no, it, it is Warren. I didn't yeah. realize he was born in, born in Hollywood. I, I... <laughs> Crazy, right? Interesting. Okay, these are gonna get a little hard. Okay, all right, okay. All right, all right, all right, so this go. next one, here we go. Another October birthday for you in the ski industry. Born in New Hampshire, also a very big medalist, has won six individual Olympic medals and five team Olympic medals, and bears the same last name, but not related to the last person we just mentioned. Bodie Miller. Correct. Yeah. It's pretty good. Pretty good. And then we got one more. This is probably, I, I would think, the hardest one here. So this individual was born and raised in Jackson Hole. In 2003, 2003 excuse me, he was named Best Contemporary Snowboarder in the World by Red Bull and has won countless freestyle medals and was the first to land a double rodeo 1080 in competition. And I'll give you one more hint if you can't get it from that. I should know that. Of all of them, I should know that as a snowboarder. His last name rhymes with mice. Oh, Travis Rice. There we go. All right. Who I've actually got to meet before, which is awesome. See? It's a great guy. <laughs> well, October birthday. So, uh, again, happy birthday from us and the production team here. We're so excited to have you here uh, as our guest today. But we have a lot of things to talk about, so let's jump right into let's it. Let's get okay? off my birthday, please. <laughs> So we got a lot to talk about, but let's go with a couple of quick updates that just happened a couple of days ago here. So Loveland fires up their snowmaking equipment. A Basin also fired up in the past couple of days. You know, looking at their temperatures just briefly, not huge windows. We're just talking a handful of hours overnight. It's going to kind of warm back up at the end of the week. So I don't think this is any major push by either one of them. Mostly testing, starting to get the guns rolling. Um, but definitely on the radar, something to kind of keep in on, on the social media pages, the, keep an eye on. The snowmaking season is, is uh, it's upon us here, and I hope that most ski areas are getting their stuff out and at least starting to test and putting water to the system, and it's it's here. I mean, it, last year we weren't but a week or two away, so it's uh, it's here. Speaking of which, Wild Mountain did place their guns. Now, this was nothing more than a marketing move because it's going to be like 80 degrees and whatnot for the next few days. And that said, looking at the temperatures, I don't think the Midwest is in any shape to be firing up in the next couple of weeks. But who knows? After that, like, 10 to 14 day, you never know what the forecast is going to bring. So we will obviously keep you guys up to date as soon as we hear a little bit more. We're going to go into our race to open bracket, which we're going to do a live stream in about a week from today. Uh, so we'll go into that a little bit later in today's episode. But this is an interesting story. Big Sky reveals updated trail map with a new ranking. Now, basically, they introduced a double blue because the inconsistency started with some of our green runs, such as Safari and El Dorado. El Dorado. El Dorado. Excuse my pronunciation there. Given their steeper headwalls, we realized that this would better represent an intermediate terrain, a.k.a. blue. So here's my argument. I know that there's going to be some naysayers out there like, OK, we don't need more convolution in this like rating system right but i would disagree because if you look at the advanced skiers we have single black double black triple black so why don't we have something similar for people that are not of that skill set right and like i talked with my wife about this because she is in this skill set 
And she absolutely agreed because there are some of those runs that like when you hit that head wall or there's that element in that run that could really throw you, it, it could really throw you for a loop. What do you think on this? There is definitely room to, to categorize more ski areas, especially on that like above blue where it's not quite super extreme, but it's relatively steep. And actually I have was at Big Sky this past winter and went down safari and went, wow, this is pretty steep for a, uh, for a blue run. You know, to help the general public figure out how to navigate a ski area is always best. You know, if they have a better experience, yeah, it's better for everyone, so. So I, I gotta remind everybody, for those of you that aren't super familiar, uh, ratings are relative to the hill, right? So like, for example, if you took a hill like Bruce Mountain, their ratings are gonna be different, but it's all based on the train that's available to that hill. So a place like Big Sky, you wanna talk about having every, every bit of terrain for everybody. You have the A to Z shoots, you have uh, the Big Claw, you have some of these iconic steep runs and then on the other side, you have some of the be like some really great beginner terrain. But if you don't have enough classification to individualize each one of those, that becomes a problem for somebody that's looking at what do we what do we do for the next step? Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more. It's uh, it helps. Uh, yeah, helps the skier navigate better. End of story. I don't think there's anything to discuss. <laughs> people people uh, I think put a lot of weight in those those ratings, especially beginners or new to, new to our sport. You know, I think all of us who are expert or intermediates uh, tend to kind of we don't even look at ah, it. yeah you it's know, a it's... steep one so it's uh, it's good for our it's good to help bring people in you know and help them help them navigate totally agree now i also i know nothing about running a ski resort really but um in my opinion i think it'd be really cool to have a one through ten rating and then one through three is green three through six is blue and then seven through ten is black and now on your smaller resorts, you would just go one, five, 10. So there wouldn't be any in differentiators between those. But if you had a bigger resort like Big Sky, you could start to get in the weeds. Now, is that convoluted? Yeah, absolutely. And then- you onto something. Eh, it's, it's an idea. You know, is that gonna cost a lot of money to develop trail maps and to go out and figure out which is which? Yeah. But you know, if we really do wanna progress the sport in that, having more information on a trail map, I think a system similar to that would give us a lot more information in a very simplistic manner. Will you be getting a tattoo of a 10 on yourself instead of a black diamond or a double black diamond? Cause I think the, the double black diamond tattoo is a very popular thing. Okay. I think I might just do a one. Just a one. Just a one. Green, Green one? circle. <laughs> one. Love it. Moving on, speaking of very difficult runs, uh, Bohemia listed, I, on Ski Magazine's brand new, highly opinionated, which I agree, list of scary terrain in North America that all skiers, and I, I'm gonna throw snowboarders in there, should add to their agendas this season. Now, I'm gonna just call out Ski Magazine right away. You can't list an entire ski area as a run. Like, I, it, you can't do that. Like, that's it says right on the title here, uh, it's runs, right? Like, we're going with runs. So, I think that's a little silly. But you know, I do agree Bohemia's got some some great steeps there. Um, I personally have never skied it, so we'll get into that in just a second. But I mean, Bohemia was listed alongside A Basin, Steep Gullies, Snow, uh, Snowbirds, Pipeline Kular, Mad River Glens, Lift Line. I mean, these are some big heavy hitters and to see Bohemia listed alongside those is pretty dang cool, I'm not gonna lie. They certainly get a lot of play in media. Kudos to Bohemia, rightfully so. The terrain up there is, it is pretty incredible. It's a, it's a very unique place. I've been there a handful of times uh, in college and, and I've had a, a fantastic time every time I've been there. Does it rival some of these other areas that are listed here? Absolutely, the terrain is, the terrain is steep, it's deep, um, it's gnarly. It might not be 5,000 vertical feet, right, but yep. uh, you know, by the time you get down to the to the chair, you're 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 ready to sit. You're not missing you're not missing any vertical or anything. You know, it is a fantastic place to go if if you're really into some extreme stuff. Are the run would you put them out like a three or a four? Then oh, what was the rating? Oh, what's the rating? I, <laughs> you know, I think they do have some triple blacks on there, so I, they might be at some twelves. That's know? not how the system works. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's some steep stuff. There's some big cliffs up there. You know, certainly the, the ratings are, are there. Um, it is not a beginner area, no doubt. But uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool, it's a unique experience that we are fortunate to have in the Midwest. Yep, sounds like we need to make it up there this season. I keep, it's on my radar every year. And for some reason, I just get busy and life happens. So this is the year. I say this every year, but this is the year. Speaking of the year, uh, it wasn't necessarily Vale's best year. Their uh, fourth quarter net income was down from last year, about 80 million, but past sales are up. They didn't announce new lifts and capital improvement projects. They say that it was uh, driven by investments in employees as well as below average snowfall, snowmaking temperatures that limited terrain availability, and a really bad Australian winter season, which I could totally see that. 
Um, you know, to go through really quick what they were looking at here, past product sales in North America increased by roughly 7% in units and about 11% in sales when you're looking at the dollar amount. And um, they said that they, they didn't really get, they don't go into details of the specific regions, but they had a blanket statement that said, uh, the business also achieved positive growth in the Midwest and Mid-Atlantic uh, regions after challenging the conditions last season, which they had absolutely terrible seasons last year. Um, they did announce new lifts for reinvestments for next year. None are in the Midwest. We had Whistler, Blackcomb, Hunter Mountain, Park City, nothing in the Midwest yet. So I guess my big question is, if, when, where uh, is Vale going to reinvest? We saw a pretty big reinvestment uh, last season with some new lifts in the Midwest. We can all speculate, certainly. Um, they, keep, uh, they keep their cards close, rightfully so. Um, you know, they've, they're doing well. You know, for reinvestments in the Midwest or even across the board, I think, you know, lifts was huge on their docket and um, they've done a really nice job with that. You know, we, we certainly think that snowmaking is hopefully up next um you know the way everything has been talking industry-wide it's you know we're aging out on our some of the snowmaking inf infrastructure certainly across the midwest and even even the whole of the country so it's it's coming up we, we certainly think that that's probably it's probably coming so absolutely i mean pure speculation i you know think vale will, will probably do a combination of some lifts in the future in the midwest i mean some of their properties uh particularly afton alps have some dated halls that definitely are going to need some attention in the next handful of years Snowmaking is one of those tricky things. I mean, you can speak to it more, but like, I feel like you always have to be reinvesting even just a little bit to always stay a little bit ahead, right? Yeah, I would agree with that. And you know, it's it's um, it's not necessarily the sexiest thing to invest in either. <laughs> you know, for the for the skiers out there and the snowboarders out there, um, it, it really is kind of the key to keeping the doors open and, and the lifts running is the snowmaking, um, but it's the thing you see the least. And Absolutely. so it's how the, it's the nucleus of the ski area, no pun intended, but. Snow making joke. <laughs> yeah, there you go, you got that one. It, it, it does make the, make the world go round and the industry go round to some degree. Absolutely, so I mean, that said, I mean, pay attention to that stuff. If you notice that the snow quality is improving at your resort, there likely has been some sort of infrastructure update going on. And you know, like we said with Marshall last week, I mean, that's the stuff, it, it's the unsung heroes, the parking lots that we talked about last week, right? The infrastructure, the stuff that costs a lot of money that not everybody sees, the pipes in the ground, the, the pumping units that aren't like showed right there. Just something to keep in mind, you know, when you see uh, your ski areas reinvesting, tell your owners, your operators, thank you. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that really does make a huge difference in the quality of snow and just the product out on, on, on the hill. So. Good job to all those ski areas reinvesting, including Bruce Mountain, who's going to be getting two new yeah, guns. Yeah, Bruce Mountain getting two new guns. Um, they're getting two TR8s, which is really cool. So there's a perfect example, a small investment that hopefully makes the experience here that much better. And shout out to Trollhagen, too, and a good, uh, you know, Buck Hill, and there's a good handful of them. So Not biased at all. No, not at all. Interesting because we're going to talk about snowmaking. This is crazy. we got a lot to talk about here. We're okay. going to dive into this, like, kind of deep. Lev Levy in Finland. Uh, we'll open the Northern Hemisphere the day that we launch this, we'll, which will be Friday. They do this by farming snow, and this isn't anything that's like groundbreaking. Actually, in Europe, they've been doing it for years. We do see some of it in the Midwest. We're going to talk all about this in just a second. But basically, for the viewers that aren't familiar, they take cats at the end of the year. They push all the snow together. They use a reflective, you know, heavy-duty tarp, put it on that. And basically they just let it sit over the summer and that snow kind of self insulates itself. You lose a little bit, obviously. What it allows you to do then is start the season with a good base. You're able to guarantee some opening dates. I mean, I know Levy mentioned that, you know, they started this just to guarantee that they'd be open for the holidays because we know how big that is, right? You miss a holiday and that could be a lot of revenue. They, they farm an incredible amount of snow. I think we're gonna see some ski areas do this more often here in the U.S., uh, you know? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, that is my next talking point here is this, how viable is this in the future? We're seeing, obviously, a lot of areas in Europe starting to, to do this process. Trollhagen has done it with success, and they have they leftover have. snow. Yeah. I mean, like, you talk to Adam Mahler, their general manager, and, you know, this year they did the Red Bull event. They're going to be doing the, obviously, Oppenhagen this Sunday, and I guarantee you they're still going to have leftover snow. Yeah, so, I mean, they, it, like you said, they've already used it for one event, and now they're going to use it for a second. So, I mean, that's a, you know, why not? And if you've, you, you most gears are left with leftover snow at the end. Um, and it's dollar signs. You can't so, even you can't even look at it like absolutely. like you can't look at it like snow like that is all so expensive to be made. 
Um, to me, it seems like the right progression to see how can we at least try to preserve it, right? Like, in, in sometimes you, you might fail. Maybe you don't have the right spot. Maybe it is a really hot summer. But, you know, I think it's worth trying. Snow farming is not for everybody, certainly. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's it's not uh, to go unrecognized and, and at least have a thought put into it, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, so some more information here. I did get word. Um, just a handful of weeks ago that Tyrell Basin has actually purchased, I think one or two of these reflective insulated tarps uh, that they are planning on maybe trying to farm some snow this off season at a more of a mass scale. They did some for a June jam this year, but I think his goal, um, Nate over at, at Tyrell is really to try to save some for the fall as well to try to get open a little earlier. So like we could open, I was telling Nick this, if we pushed a big enough pile of snow, I mean, we don't have a lot of land to cover, so like if we were able to get it to work, I mean, you could kind of open on demand in the fall. We it's, could win the race to open it, it's every year. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy, but it's not, it's that, crazy. it's not that crazy. But you know, I, I, it would be interesting to see some people give it a, give it a stab, see what happens, right? And then I'm sure others, if it was successful, others would follow. And speaking of opening the Northern Hemisphere, I think the Midwest is going to open North America. Um, and we had to talk about our 2023 race to open bracket. Now, dude, this this bracket is unlike anything I have ever seen. Every ski area in the bracket was tied with another ski area opening the same day. Isn't that crazy? We actually had one day, Black Friday, November 25th, we had 13 ski areas open on the same exact day. And by Thanksgiving weekend, on or before Thanksgiving weekend, we had 45 ski areas open. That's an incredible number, quite frankly. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's it's crazy to look at that on paper because that is truly an incredible number. Um, and I, I think the race to open is a, is such a great, it's a fun thing, and I think it gets people hyped up for sure. Um, you know, n not every ski area is going to play the first to open game, and I know that you know some locals may get frustrated with that. But and it's not possible in every in, in every area either. And that's the other thing is there's there's few that uh, you see are the 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 known subjects, you know, Trollhog and Wild, uh, Andy's Towers, uh, Ski Brule, those guys are, you know, sit, sit in either valleys or have odd yep. cold snaps that they get, which is really nice for them. And, you know, you, some of the lower ski areas, they'll, they're going to push as hard as they can. But the fact that we were able to, op that Midwest was able to open this many ski areas on that day is, is truly incredible. It's just rowdy. It's rowdy for sure. I don't know. I love it. Uh, I, uh... You know, the, the, the early season game is a great, it's a great time. I mean, I know I'm chomping at the bit. Uh, to get the snowboard out and people will ski a white ribbon to death and it's fun. This is fun. I will agree with PJ. You know, we, we do a lot of videos. If you guys we will talk more about it in our race to open live stream, but you know, there is a lot of strategy that goes into this. People are not just blowing snow into the sky and, and deciding to open on a whim. I mean, this is, it's strategic. People put a lot of thought in this and some people are more aggressive than others. And I always tell people with this race to open bracket, just because somebody opens earlier than somebody else doesn't mean they have inadequate equipment. doesn't mean that they're an inferior uh, ski area by any means. We do we pull the top 36 from the previous year, and then that's how we do how we pull our seedings for for this year. Now, we had a lot of ties as we just mentioned, but we had a really interesting situation because from 29 seed 29 to 41 was all a tie. Everybody opened on November 25th last year. So, to fix this problem moving forward, we have a couple of things. It's going to be ranked this season for everyone that's wondering based off of obviously date. If it is the same date, we're not going to go into time because there's East Coast members such as Michigan, there's West Coast or you know Central. What we're going to do is how many runs you opened with will be the next determining factor. So if you opened with three runs versus somebody that opened with one run, that's going to be the next seeding placement just so we can avoid multiple big pushes like this where it's kind of like and it gives those that do wait a little bit a little bit of a leg up because they might open with more terrain. Now this year we have a situation though where we have this 13 way tie and we have to figure out how we're gonna seed these. So I'm gonna have my guest PJ um, pull out of this bag here of all of our 13 and we're just gonna write them in as we go, producer Nick. I mean, this is, I know, riveting stuff and not the most scientific way to do this, but I don't know what else to do to be fair. So, so I'll so, just have you pull one out. I guarantee you they're all in there. I checked them this morning. Okay. They're folded up triple or whatever so nobody can see. So what do we got? This is for rank number 29. We have Giants Ridge Resort. Ooh, Giants Ridge. Yeah. Maybe one of the ones that's not going to play the first open game, nope. but uh, you never know. 
take out of the Ziploc baggie there. All right. Ausplick Ski Hill. That's a sleeper Private pick. Private Ski Hill. You know, they might open first, but you're not going to get to ride there. All right. And then we'll go to 31. Nordic Mountain, Wisconsin. <laughs> Nordic Mountain. All right. See, you know, this, this, might, this is a sleeper here because they... Uh, <laughs> They've got the they've got the means to do it. So if they get the cold, will they play the game? That's the uh, that's the question. Thirty two. These are all play ins, by the way. So Spirit Mountain. That's a sleeper too. Also, I think a sleeper. That's one that could certainly uh, surprise surprise anyone. The problem is they're so close to the lake. They get lake guys, effect in a negative way. Yeah, they you know a lot of people think the closer you are to Lake Superior, the better, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, it actually retains a lot of heat. So what do you got for 33? Detroit Mountain. Detroit Mountain. Yeah. Also a sleeper. I agree. We're going to go 34. Welch Village. They're one that definitely plays the slower game in the sense of wanting they to do, open with they, more terrain. Yeah, they like to open with a lot of terrain, and kudos to them. I think it's a, fa it's a fair move. I mean, it's a big area. It's a big yeah. area there. It's, it actually it's all, takes a lot to get that place open. Wider right? runs, a little more vertical than you some know, of the others on this bracket. Something to be talked about, you know, wild opens with a with a rope toe, and but to get most of these ski, area, ski areas open, it's it's days upon days of snowmaking. Days. So. Thirty. Devil's Head. Five is Devil's. Devil's Head. Head. That's a tough one, man. That's a tough south one. That's facing. south facing. They they have one of the hardest snowmaking. Uh, play the one of the hardest snowmaking climates in the Midwest. If you had, to, if I had, they to. do. They've they've recently done some um some upgrades to their snowmaking uh with some new guns, some new sticks. So I'm excited to see how that fares because yeah. they've been running those um MSI 320s. 320s. <laughs> <laughs> Not SMI 320s. MSI 320s. There's an interesting story about that. We'll we'll get into that some other show. No comment. 36. Caber Fay Peaks. Caber Fay. That's another really good operation. That, Tim and Pete, shout out to those guys. Salt of the earth right there. Well, guys, that is, we have our bracket now set. We're going to upload this, our live stream for this bracket, where I'm going to fill it out, drink beers, and have some fun. Will be next Thursday, whatever date that is. Producer Nick, help me out. Thursday is the 12th. Yes. So we are going to have the live stream back at this Thursday, the 12th at 7 p.m., where we're going to stream. I'm going to talk about all these matchups, which ones I think are the most interesting, which ones are going to be the most competitive. And I'll give you some insights as to what I've seen from the infrastructure side, what kind of improvements they have going on. It's a lot of fun. And we're going to have some guests in the studio as well. So it's going to be a lot of fun. You guys should tune in. That will be this Thursday at 7 o'clock. It is time to wrap up with our ending segment, which we always end with, which is call Producer Dix tries to stump us, and we don't have a better name for the segment. Producer Dix tries to stump us. Producer Dick tries to stump us. Another installation every week. New questions, same format, multiple Points choice. Points don't matter. Well, look, they kind of matter. Producer Nick stumps <laughs> us. I did pretty good on the uh, on the trivia at the beginning. Birthday boy has the luck, maybe. It's going to be PJ and I versus producer Nick. So it's going to be guest and me host for uh, trying to stump Nick. So it'll just be a record. So we're one and one right now. You got the first bout with, you know, Matt and I, Matt and I versus you. Marsha and I crushed it. It wasn't even a contest. You got me on the lavender candles. I I know my candles, man. Listen. Are you coming out with a candle brand? It'd be cool to have a skier candle. Does that exist? I mean, it's basically smell like, like boot drink. sweat. Yeah, I know. Like, what would it, what would it smell like? Sweat Weed and, and beer. <laughs> I'm just saying, we, we could probably come up with some. Tod so, toddler gator snot. Shiv wheel bearing grease. Shiv wheel bearing grease. Homeless stains on expensive white jackets. PJ and I are going to get to kind of talk through some of the questions, and then he'll write the official answer that we have. Um, and you're going down this week, Nick. What do you got for us? There are questions. Oh, there are questions. So question one, as we're here at lovely Bruce Mound, the ski area is named Bruce Mound, but also the geologic feature. It's thought to have been named after Franklin Bruce, a popular figure in the 1840s. My question is, what profession was Mr. Bruce? Was he A, a logger, B, a railroad engineer, yeah, or yeah. C, a postmaster? Dude, these are, that's, you picked good multiple choices. I don't think it's postmaster. Logger makes some sense. He cleared the runs. He did something with the logs, right? Dude, the railroads though, are huge, like around here. So am I writing this down? Settle down oh, okay. here for a minute. Logger's pretty common. Logger. Not to be confused with logger. Not to be confused. Which we'll have in a little bit later. Official answer. A logger is correct. All right. Nice job. 
Yeah, we're taking this one, Nick. I was hoping for a rebound week here, but we'll we'll see. So I'm not the expert, but as I understand, snowmaking was discovered somewhat accidentally I know how. in a low temperature wind tunnel in Canada, <laughs> where scientists were attempting to study rime ice build up on jet engines. Researchers sprayed water close to the intake to simulate real world conditions. And while they didn't create ice, they made snow. So much that they had to keep shutting the wind tunnel down to shovel it. In what year was this first snow artificially created? Was it A, 1937, B, 1940, or C, 1952? I'm going to get raked for this. <laughs> I should know this. Not only am I in the snowmaking world and I work for a snowmaking company, but I've studied this. You have college. a binder I with all this a information. Binder, I have a binder with this particular information. Okay, so let's go through it really quick. So 52, I think, is out because I think Mohawk already had snowmaking installed. It was right point. around then. Right around then. 40s ringing a bell. 37 seems early seems to me, early. doesn't it? It does. I, you know, again, I should know this. Um, I know it was some time after they figured out how to do it before anything was made for skiing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with a B. B is correct. We <laughs> won, but you give us the, Mohawk. give us the last one for, for craps and giggles. Yeah, we got, we got one more. You already got me beat, but uh, I, I might as well give you this last one. So. This, this is defined as the most recognized song in the English language. Happy birthday is generally attributed to two <laughs> Kentucky sisters, a principal and a music teacher, uh, adapted from their song that they wrote for kindergartners called Good Morning to All. Now, in what year is the first recorded printing of the song Happy Birthday? Is it 1901, 1893, or 1912? October birthdays are the best. They are, I can, I can vouch for that. Can we get the options again? I was so fixated. <laughs> it is trivia, whether it's related to anyone or not. It was first printed A, 1901, 1901, 1893, or 1912. I've already lost. I might as well have a ridiculous question. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't, we'll give you this one, but I don't even have, like, where do you start with this question? I don't know. Uh, it's I, a ridiculous I, song. I'm gonna go turn to the 18th century. Yeah, what is it, 1897? 1893 is option B. I think it's B. All right, B it is. I have actually C, 1912. Whoa! Which is, which is the same year the Titanic sank, so that kind of gives you a... Were they singing happy birthday on the Titanic? May have done at, <laughs> at one point. I don't think as it went down. There's actually discrepancy because the band, some people claim they heard the Episcopal hymn Autumn, and other people claim they heard the band this? playing Nearer My God to Thee. I oh, live in Minnesota, like I got, Cameron you know, the Great Lakes, that. ships, water, all that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, whatever, 1912. What, hey, we still won though, we beat producer we, Nick. We beat him. All right, guys and gals, that is our show for this week. Tune in next week where we're going to be back in the studio. Hopefully, we don't go on a, on a march. We're going to be with Benjamin Bartz, GM of Snow River. Excited to talk to him. He's got a lot of stuff going on up there. But until next week, I hope all of you have a great week. Pray for that snow or cold weather, and I'll see you out there.